Hi, I'm Manon Sharma. Thank you for the nice introduction, Joe, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Good morning to those of y'all on the West Coast and good afternoon to those of you um, in the central and eastern parts of the country. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, just some general stuff about food safety and the use of what we call manure or untreated and treated biological soil amendments. Um, I'm a research microbiologist, as Joe mentioned, with the USDA Agricultural Research Service, and I'm based in um, Beltsville, Maryland, just between Washington, D.C. and um, Baltimore. And the reason we care about how uh, food safety and manure and then what we call untreated biological soil amendments is that we know a lot of people um, are eating produce. And actually, if you looked at data from the agricultural census, uh, we saw that leafy greens like spinach and romaine, the acreage of them uh, planted in the last, according to the last agricultural census, the, that acreage actually increased. Um, so we know people are eating produce. We want people to eat produce because we know it has a lot of health benefits. It's good a lot of nutritional issues in this country. Um, we want people to eat produce. We just want less people to become sick uh, doing it. Um, and you know, by some estimates, it's about half the number of cases of foodborne illness in the United States are attributed to contaminated produce. Uh, leafy greens account for a large proportion of that. If you look at it from a cost basis, I um, mean, it's estimated about $152 billion a year uh, the economy, it costs the economy and everybody else, you know, from foodborne related illnesses and about 38 billion of that, it's estimated is attributed to contaminated foodborne illness from contaminated produce. So it really is, you know, a public health issue. It's an economic issue. And it's just something that we want to try and prevent. We know that the, uh, you know, the consumption of some beef, some meat commodities is flat, but you can see here, this is an article from The Economist from January of 2019, um, where we're growing more and more chickens around the world, and more and more chickens are being raised, and that means that we have a lot more poultry litter um, to deal with, and to deal with in an environmentally responsible way, and in a way that doesn't, um, you know, cause more environmental problems for us. Um, and as you all might be aware, if you have too many nutrients that go into water, for example, um, you get a lot of bad, bad effects um, for the environment and then for the economies related to those environments and human health issues as well. So when you have floods or a lot of nutrients flowing down the Mississippi River, you can create these dead zones that happen in the Gulf of Mexico. So one way to mitigate that is to try and apply some of these manures, which are nutrient rich onto soil, which I think is a good thing because you can then use the nutrients um, in that manure and that poultry litter um, to, grow, to grow produce. And um, one of the things we want to do is we wanna transfer those nutrients from that untreated soil amendment to allow the crops to use those, but we don't wanna transfer all the pathogens that are potentially present in those untreated or, or raw manure. So we want to use the nutrients um, and try and leave the pathogens behind. And we know that these pathogens are in these raw manures through various other surveys that people have done. Um, and studying this is a complex issue. Um, all produce safety is local. Um, and that means that they're affected by its own geography, its own weather patterns. And all of those things differ from um, from regions of the country, even from state to state, even from, in some cases, county to county, like if you live where I live near the Chesapeake Bay, it's a very dynamic weather pattern. So studying microorganisms in this environment um, can be challenging, and that's all I wanted to mention um, with this slide. And what that, why that's challenging from a public health perspective and from a food microbiology perspective is that it's really hard to sort of track where these pathogens go where they started from, where they are, where they're going. Um, you know, when we have produce outbreaks with leafy greens or cantaloupes or tomatoes or sprouts, um, you know, the pathogens don't leave a note. They don't say, oh, well, I got here through the irrigation water, but I was in manure before that. And then it got transferred to this crop and that's what caused the infection. If it were so easy, it would be great, but that's really not what happens. And these investigations into these outbreaks are really time consuming and challenging logistically and scientifically. Um, so it's, it's really hard to sort of recreate the puzzle of, of why these things occur, which is why sometimes we don't always have a great idea of what caused a specific outbreak. 
And one of the organisms we're really concerned about in these types of outbreaks is E. coli 0157H7, um, which is a specific kind of E. coli called enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Why this is so bad is because it has two virulence mechanisms that can really get a human sick. One is it produces the shiga toxin, so there's different types of shiga toxins, but essentially all shiga toxins do is shut down your kidneys. They're a really potent toxin, shut down your kidneys. This really affects children in a lot of cases who suffer the most severe effects. Um, and that's really why, that's probably the most important virulence factor. But they also have something that's called EAE, which is an attachment factor, which allows it to form this really nice bond tight junction with, uh, with the cells in your gastrointestinal tract. And that is uh, also causes a lot of diarrhea and fluid loss. So this is just um, the, in the red box you can see here, this basically dual virulence mechanisms that E. coli 0157H7 and other EHEX have, which is what makes them very, very, uh, very, very dangerous um, from a public health perspective. And you really do not want to get one of these infections um, along with the acute symptoms, there are also long lasting effects as well. Um, and like I said, um, it's really hard to track some of these outbreaks. Um, there, were there were outbreaks in Arizona um, a few years ago, and they were basically saying, well, they found the pathogen in the water, but it's really not that simple sometimes. It's, well, how did it get to the water? Did it go from the water to the contaminated romaine lettuce? Did it go directly from, say, um, a CAFO to the lettuce? Was it windborne? Was it adjacent land use? There are a lot of different questions that we have about um, what the actual progression is here. Um, and so again, it's just a really complicated thing um, to do, to investigate. So one of the ways that uh, we can be preventive about this is following the guidelines set forth in the Food Safety Modernization Act. And the Food Safety Modernization Act was established um, in uh, the law was passed, I think, in 2010 or early 2011. And basically, it was a lot of preventative steps to uh, prevent the contamination of, uh, of, of produce. And one of the things it wants to address is how we handle these untreated biological soil amendments of an animal origin. And what it states is that currently it has no objection to the rules used in the National Organic Program established by the USDA and how it handles soil amendments. And basically what the National Organic Program says is if your crop is growing uh, far away from the soil where the soil is unlikely to touch the crop, you can apply these untreated soil amendments um, and then harvest your crop within 90 days after planting. But if your crop grows close to the ground, then you have to wait 120 days. And again, this is to prevent allow the die off of some of those pathogens that are present in, in raw animal manures. Um, but this National Organic Program rule, the FDA said it had no objection. Um, and if we think of, go back and look at the history of how those rules were developed, that 90 and 120 day interval, um, there really wasn't a lot, of sci a lot of science, a lot of data collected to support that rule. Um, and so I don't know if any of you all have ever seen the movie Pirates of the Caribbean, but they talk about the pirate code and how there are more like guidelines instead of just a code. And that's kind of how I think about the National Organic Program rules. They're good, they're good guidelines. Um, there's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with them. They seem to work, but we really need a lot more data around it to support that. What is really happening in specific areas? Does this rule apply to all geographies, all weather conditions, et cetera, like that? So we really need a lot more scientific data. So in collaboration with the Food and Drug Administration and a couple of our academic researchers like the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, we set out to do that, collect data and apply some science here and see if we can get a little more specific on this. So we conducted a really large study. We used three sites in the mid-Atlantic US. Um, we were basically looking to see if we applied E. coli to plots containing different types of animal manures like dairy manure, poultry litter, horse manure, or left them unamended. If we tilled in the manure, if we left it on the surface, if we looked at soils that were previously managed in an, in an organic way, can we basically just track the survival of E. coli under all those different environments and see what it tells us? So this is a really big study. I'm not gonna bore you guys with the details. I'm just showing you these slides to tell you that we didn't make up these data. We actually did this experiment. It took experimentally over four years and then a couple of years to analyze the data because it was so big. 
and to get the papers out. So this is just a really large effort by a lot of, uh, a lot of colleagues and collaborators. And basically what we found when we put all of this together, what we found is that, you know, poultry litter amended soils compared to dairy manure amended or horse manure amended soils really supported longer survival durations of E. coli, which was the bacteria that we were measuring that we put in. We knew how much we put in. We knew how much we could basically see how long it survived and at what levels. But what else we found out was that the site, like where your farm is, the year, in the season were all really influential in determining the durations of E. coli in the soils, almost in some cases um, more influential than the specific type of amendment that, that we were using. So really, it's really hard to separate the, the effect of these environmental factors or these weather factors and these geography factors away from the specific biological effect of what uh, animal amendment you're using. So our FDA colleagues took that same data set and because it was so large, they could do some other different types of analyses. And in their analysis, what they came up with is that amendment type was really important and they found the same thing. Poultry litter predicted a longer survival duration than other amendments. But the number of days of rain that were in that specific season were also a really good predictor of E. coli survival. So again, you're seeing how the weather, uh, what we would call the temporal factors here, play a role in influencing bacterial survival in soils containing um, animal manures. And from that standpoint, we picked that up. Um, the F we collaborated with the FDA again. They were interested in getting some more data. So they funded uh, another study that was a collaboration with the University of Delaware and our agency, where we're basically now looking more specifically at uh, organic fertilizers based on poultry litter, whether it was raw poultry litter, composted poultry litter, or heat-treated poultry litter take those amendments, add them to the soils. But in this case, now we were going to actually grow cucumbers in those soils and look to see how much E. coli actually transfers from that contaminated or soil containing high levels of E. coli um, to those cucumbers. And basically what we saw was that yes, the amendment makes effects and uh, it interacts with the season. So there is this combination of seasonal um, and biological effects. But if you look at this graph here, the one that says 2018 and 2019, this is how much E. coli it transferred to our cucumbers. And you can see in 2018, you get some transfer here. Those black lines indicate that we were getting E. coli off of those cucumbers that we grew. But if you look under 2019, you don't see a lot of lines. We didn't see a lot of recovery of E. coli from those cucumbers in 2019. So we got a big year difference here. Um, so year was a really important factor. So what was so different about these two years? Well, it was really the amount of rainfall and the pattern of rainfall. And so in 2018, we got more rainfall than in 2019. And you can see by these lines here, the patterns were, were very different. So again, this just indicates that the weather, the rainfall amounts, and the combination of biological soil amendments um, really drives E. coli survival in soils and transfer to, um, to fruits or, or vegetables um, in what we call a pre-harvest environment, which is just a fancy way of saying in the field. Um, so really, you know, to conclude, we just say that the year, the spatial temporal effects here, weather patterns, they can really influence how long E. coli survives in soils that contain these biological soil amendments. We really want to take these large data sets that we're working with right now and try and get things down to sort of one number. If there's a one predictive variable that we can look at and say, well, this is a really good clue for how long E. coli can survive in soils and give some reassurance to the, to the growers and farmers that are still using um, these untreated soil amendments. Um, and it really is, you know, these multi-year studies, these retrospective, retrospective studies that have a lot of data um, that we're trying to, trying to pull these clues out of, tease some of these factors out and see what that translates to on a practical level that people can use on their farms. So I just wanna thank all the people who have collaborated, um, my agency, the Agricultural Research Service, and our collaborators at the Food and Drug Administration, also at the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, and the University of Delaware. And we've had a lot of, a lot of really good scientists, a lot of good students, a lot of good postdoctoral research associates who have worked on all of these projects and none of it could have been done without their input um, and hard work. So with that, I'll conclude and say thank you.